Hello and welcome to Dialogue with Thinkers. I'm Xu Qingdu. Today we are very glad to be joined by Lord Davison of Glen Clover KOC, Shadow Spokesperson at the Labour Party of the UK, member of the House of Lords, and we are going to take a close look at the China-UK relationship in perspective and a number of issues deeply related to those two nations. Welcome to the discussion, Lord Davison. Now the UK has its new Prime Minister as uh, Ms. Truss won more support among Tories uh, in early September. So uh, what do you think are the major tasks or you know, challenges, priorities for the new government? Well, the new government faces a lot of challenges here in the UK. Uh, inflation plainly is one, cost of living, um, the way in which people have had a decline in their living standards. Uh, the problems with uh, our institutions, such as the health service and the education system. There are a lot of difficult issues that the new prime minister has to deal with. And then, of course, there's the international theme, which is uh, troubled at the moment, I think one might say. Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, energy prices continue to rise, uh, and also, of course, uh, you know, people are talking about this the cost of living crisis in the UK, even a possible recession later on. I mean, how big a challenge is that? Um, this is a new prime minister whose background has not really been directed towards the economy. Um, she is going to face very serious challenges. Um, the background of recession, energy problems, institutional issues, these are not easy to deal with. And hitherto, we've had um, a government that has not been especially competent in dealing with these types of issues. Um, the previous prime minister was very much a campaigner rather than a man who was uh, skilled in government. And we can only hope that uh, Ms. Truss is much more skilled than he was. We shall see. We shall see. Uh, all right. If you look at uh, you know uh, the relationship between China and the UK, you know during the prime minister uh, competition, uh, Liz Truss said uh, that you know she might consider listing China as a national threat if elected. Now uh, she's elected, so I wonder what do you make of her remarks on relationship with China? She was going to say that China was a threat, but the story never actually turned into a fact, and I do wonder that uh, Ms. Truss, who has been rather shrill about UK-China relations, whether she is now confronted with the reality of being in government and has to recognize the importance of a mutually respectful relationship between the UK and China. I certainly hope that is the way that she will now proceed because campaigning and rhetoric to the Conservative Party is one thing, living in the real world with real relationships with the world's uh, second largest economy is rather important. Uh, you know, uh, we have seen the rivals, you know, Truss and Sunak, you know, locked in the battle to take the toughest line on China. And as a, re as a result, you know, some would say all relationship with China became a casualty of the competition. Uh, you know, people would say oh, Britain's next prime minister you know, is guaranteed to be a China hawk, no matter who wins. Uh, so I wonder how do you make of that? And, uh, you know, like, is that just a campaign language rhetoric or, you know, because of the campaign, somehow the attitude toward China is getting, let's say, worsened? Well, one has to bear in mind that Ms. Trust, when she was uh, campaigning, was addressing only 160,000 Conservative members. These people tend to be rather, they see themselves anti-communist. They see China as communist. And therefore, to try and encourage them to vote for her, she has taken an anti-China line from time to time. As I said earlier, I think she is going to now confront reality and realize that uh, you can't govern in campaign language. That I suspect that she may have a rather more friction-laden attitude to China than previous Conservative Prime Ministers, but we will see how that develops. Uh, and also, there's, uh, of course, you know, when we look at uh, you know, British uh, China policy, there's uh, 
a factor. People would say uh, element of the United States. Uh, some would say you know, British foreign policy is almost a complete overlap with the U.S., whether on the Iranian nuclear deal, climate change, the importance of uh, spending more on defense, NATO, Russia, or now China. Is that the case? You know, how big a role in the U.S. factor uh, in the U.K.'s uh, you know, China policy? Well, I mean, it's a historical fact that the UK has been an ally of the US for many years. Um, but what is absolutely clear, and which uh, Conservative Prime Ministers over the past have uh, always recognised, that the UK strategic interests are not identical to the US strategic interests, and therefore simply mirroring US policy is a, an unsound way forward for the UK. Even Mrs. Thatcher fell out with Ronald Reagan from time to time. Yeah, you said it, uh, you know, an interesting point you mentioned here is, uh, you know, UK interest is not identical with the US, you know, which is competing with China geopolitically, uh, right? For, of course, the US is talking about their maintaining supremacy, but that's not the goal of the UK, right? And the UK does have <laughs> some interest in the China relationship here. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the notion that the UK is competing on a global level with China is uh, ridiculous. Uh, the UK has its uh, past uh, in the imperial world where uh, it was a world player. That is no longer the position, plainly. The UK has to look to its own strategic interests. The UK is a trading nation above all. China is uh, the world's largest trading nation, the UK has to have a sensible, mutually respectful relationship with China on a pragmatic, sensible, rational basis. We can't have uh, rhetoric that simply creates friction, that produces an adversarial relationship. That would hardly be intelligent or sensible. Uh, right. Uh, you know, former UK Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair said in a recent uh, speech uh, that the biggest geopolitical change of the century will come from China, not Russia. And uh, he called for a policy towards Beijing of strength plus engagement. Uh, I wonder what's your opinion on Mr. Blair's suggestion here? Well, I, I think uh, Mr. Blair got the tense wrong. China's time has come. It's not something about the future. And as for strength, um, by strength, what I would hope uh, he meant was competent government. The UK can only be strong if it has competent government. We have had a period where competent governments has not been uh, very much to the fore. That, I think, if that is what Mr. Blair meant, then I would agree with him. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, long term, of course, you know, there's um, uh, a piece in the Atlantic uh, saying that uh, there's a uh, policy cycle of the UK toward China, you know, 2015, uh, you know, the uh, UK presents itself as the, uh, the best partner in the West with China. And of course, the UK became this, uh, uh, the founding member of uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And then in 2020, we have the UK, uh, of course, you know, banning Huawei. And then uh, this year, uh, the Johnson uh, government uh, basically uh, restarted negotiation, trade negotiation with China, sort of like back and forth a little bit. Uh, so, uh, you know, what makes that kind of policy, let's say, uh, you know, ch policy change sometimes is completely aligned with the U.S. and then at other time the U.K. seems is trying to asserting or reasserting its interests uh, with the relationship in China? Yes. Um, I I guess that must seem rather confusing if one's on the Chinese side. In what exactly is the UK's uh, desired relationship with China? And I consider the problem has really been one of a volatility in our politics. Um, it's what I was saying earlier about the competence in government. We need a, a competent government in the UK that has a clear strategy and that pursues that strategy blowing hot and cold on the China relationship is simply going to send a confusing message to China. What we need to do is put our relationship on a sensible, 
strategic, mutually respectful basis. We need to do that. We haven't been doing that, sending these mixed messages. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at the positive side, of course, uh, at the two you know, big trading powers and the permanent members of the UN Security Council, UK and the US. And uh, as we mentioned, the UK is a founding member of the AIIB, you know, lending also a major offshore center for RMB trading. Uh, so in, in which areas do you see, you know, probably more possible cooperation between the two nations? The climate change, uh, dealing with pandemics, um, dealing with energy issues. These are areas where there should be mutual cooperation. But particularly, and I think redesigning the architecture of international institutions is an area where the UK and China could combine very, very usefully. Uh, global institutions reflect the past dominance of the West. The world has changed. It's now multipolar. These institutions require to be redesigned to reflect the new realities. They're very much stuck in the past. This is an area where the UK, which is a convening power in a sense, the UK can bring people together and we can discuss how these institutions could be sensibly redesigned. Mm -hmm. uh, are you talking about a possibility like the UK can act as a bridge, for example, to bring the Chinese Americans together to do the necessary reforms in terms of global governance? Well, that, that would be one way. I, I think also opening the discussion and finding areas where China interests can be translated into ways that the Americans can understand sensibly, where the rest of the world can understand sensibly. I think the, the UK could be a pathfinder in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, another, uh, of course, you know, issue between the two sides, let's say, uh, is the um, Belt and Road Initiative. You know, we can see in media coverage, you know, uh, in remarks by politicians, uh, the UK is actively aiding efforts to curb China's Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, not only the UK, but also other uh, Western nations. People have this concern, you know, uh, whether this is uh, an initiative to increase uh, expand the Chinese influence in poorer countries. People have this concern. And we can see that, uh, you know, it, 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 it is, uh, uh, there are also efforts by the G7, for example, the US, the European Union, uh, counter efforts, I would call it, uh, to uh, basically to balance or to compete with Belt and Road Initiative. How are those efforts going? The effect of the Chinese economy which is now very, very large, is inevitably going to have effects on the rest of the world. BRI is a rational approach for a large economy that seeks to have relations with other economies. Um, that, that is simply an objective fact. If uh, the West or the US or even the UK doesn't like BRI, then it should compete and should compete in a sensible way, saying this is what we have to offer, if China has that to offer, we leave that to other countries to choose which is the better way forward. And economic competition is the sensible way in which the relationship uh, be developed. In this sense, you know, th this kind of competition is actually good. You know, you, you have, uh, say, the Chinese uh, investment in the roads, infrastructures, you know, airports, for example, uh, that can be used by other countries, of course, like in African continent. And similarly, uh, if investment from the US or the UK uh, in the similar infrastructures that can also be used by the Chinese investors or Chinese businesses, uh, businessmen over uh, in Africa or in Latin America. Uh, so, of course, it should be welcomed if there, is, there are more investment from the European nations, from the US, uh, for example. The Western economists always speak of the, the virtues of competition that this is the way that creates great, greatest welfare for a population. And to suddenly turn around and say, oh, we don't like this type of economic competition, does seem slightly irrational. So one questions what is going on. Is this simply political position taking? Or is it really based on uh, some kind of opposition to too much economic competition? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, let's, uh, you know, shift to the uh, domestic uh, affairs of China a little for a while. Uh, you know, the uh, Communist Party of China, the National Congress, 
20th National Congress you know, will take place next month on the 16th. Uh, this is clearly a very important political gathering in China this year. Uh, so people are expecting those several key decisions to be made about the country's development in the f next five years uh, or so. So what do you expect the most uh, out of this meeting? Well, it's really uh, not for a British politician to have anticipations about what is going to happen at the Party Congress. Plainly, it's a highly significant matter globally. Um, we will see what uh, emerges from that, and the UK will have to respond and consider what does happen. What I, I suspect is highly likely, however, is that we will see continued growth by the Chinese economy in all the positive areas, dealing with matters of energy, uh, climate change, and so on. And I think it's important on a global basis that uh, the rest of us look more intelligently at what China proposes to do for the next five years, because what China says it is going to do is usually what China does. And this is not like the political statements that one sometimes gets in the UK that last a week or two and then are reversed. China has a rational plan for the future. We need to look at that carefully. Uh, we need to see where China is going and how we can adapt uh, to, to mm -hmm. those changes. Uh, you, you mentioned a very interesting point, you know, when the Chinese uh, uh, leaders, government officials, when they say what we are going to do, usually that's uh, what they meant to do <laughs> because it's a different uh, political practice. Uh, speak of that, of course, we see over the past decades, you know, China has uh, explored its own path in terms of uh, nation building, uh, economic development, uh, despite the fact that, you know, China still has uh, divergences on a number of issues and uh, concepts even uh, with mm -hmm. countries like the UK and some other Western uh, nations. From your perspective, you know, how do you see China's uh, political philosophy and also government system, which is obviously different, as we said, from the West, uh, but China also, you know, achieved a tremendous and massive development over the past decades. Everybody recognizes the development that China has made. They're pulling 700 million people out of poverty, something that's never been done before in uh, the world's history. A remarkable achievement. Uh, the way in which the economy has moved from an agricultural base to a highly developed uh, economy is again a remarkable achievement, again unparalleled in history. These, are, these don't happen simply through luck, they happen through sustained pragmatic planning and the way in which the leadership of China has made that planning work, has carried it through, is remarkable. Now, the past of the UK um, has obviously been um, representative democracy in our sense. But we should perhaps see how it is that China has achieved these successes and how we can learn from them. We face problems as well. Um, our solutions may be different, but they may learn from what China has done. Let's take a look at the European affair, for example, uh, you know, as, other than COVID, uh, the pandemic. Uh, perhaps the biggest, you know, uh, factor impacting the world, as you mentioned earlier, is uh, uh, the Ukraine conflict and a series of related problems, you know, energy prices, shortage, inflation, uh, deeply bothering countries uh, in Europe. Uh, I wonder, you know, what do you see, the, 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 like how long will the conflicts continue and in what way do you see the war will conclude? When will this war come to an end? I certainly don't know. I've had uh, people say it could last 10 years. I certainly hope that is not the case. But what is clear is that um, there are definite lessons to be learned from this. Uh, how can we avoid war? There seems to have been an assumption that, certainly in uh, Europe, that peace was somehow permanent. That is no longer uh, obviously the case. Um, we have to look again at how peace can be maintained. We have to look at the institutions of this area that work to maintain peace, that reduce conflict. We need to also consider 
um, the way in which rhetoric can go astray. There's been discussion about the use of nuclear weapons, for example. I mean, that really has to be something that's looked at very, very seriously. Um, we have to look at also um, how it is that sanctions are said to work. This is an entirely novel use of sanctions against such a large economy as Russia. There is this blowback, if you will, in relation to energy, the prices, that this may cause recession throughout Europe. Um, one also has to look at how Russia is going to have a relationship with Europe in the future, should this uh, war be settled uh, at some point in the relatively near future. There are a whole lot of changes that are going to happen. I don't know where they're all going to end up. Um, I do hope, and it can only be a hope, that there will be no greater escalation of this war and that it can be kept under some kind of rational control. Mm -hmm. uh, well, on ties with the uh, European Union, you know, there's a report that the U.S. is concerned over uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, you know, how will be, you know, the controversial, um, which is controversial, let's say, a rewriting of the protocol uh, may affect the ties with the EU? Well, we have had some statements from this trust about the, the future of the protocol with Northern Ireland. Um, but that was campaign rhetoric. Is the problem that she faces that she will have to find a solution to. Um, I can't say that I'm particularly optimistic that a rational decision will be made in relation to that relationship anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously that will be an issue between the UK and the European Union. Uh, for example, uh, the, the France, uh, the French probably, they will feel a bit concerned about that. And also, you know, Truss during the campaign said uh, she's not sure whether France is a friend or foe. Uh, how, how will that kind of uh, remarks plus uh, po possible policy in terms of the protocol, you know, affect the relationship with the EU? Well, that, that is a, an example par excellence of a politician saying something to please the audience that was directly in front of her a number of uh, Conservative Party members, and they always have a love-hate relationship with France. But France is our closest neighbour. We have a long history together. We have fought wars together. Um, we have a very good relationship with France on a normal basis. I do hope that this trust will avoid that kind of uh, rhetoric in the future. Um, we have to live with the rest of the EU. They are our closest economic partners, despite Brexit. Um, we have to have a rational, pragmatic relationship in that uh, regard. Mm -hmm. uh, well, meanwhile, we are seeing the SNP uh, push for another attempt at uh, independence for Scotland. You know, uh, the head of the party, Nicola Sturgeon, is calling for another referendum for independence next October. Uh, in 2014, of course, uh, you know, for those who are not that close to this uh, uh, development, you know, Scots voted 55% versus 45% to stay in the UK. So what makes Sturgeon think, you know, this new referendum may have a different result? And uh, how is the UK dealing with uh, this kind of scenario? Uh, I suspect that this demand for another referendum is a reflection of internal tensions within the Nationalist Party. Um, I suspect the uh, change, no, uh, no change will uh, arise. Fragmentation of the UK is plainly economically unsound. It's a way forward. Politically, it is also unsound. Um, the notion that uh, the uh, people of Scotland wish to be free, in some sense, from oppression by the rest of the United Kingdom is simply to state it ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ms. Truss, uh, just like uh, Mr. Borising has said that, uh, you know, uh, referendum only happens in generation. So the landing will not allow another referendum in 2024. Uh, will that be, a, a, say, a quarrel over that? Well, I think that's that you, you've identified the point exactly. Uh, Mr. Sturgeon is trying to create a quarrel rather than a referendum. 
the way in which she has uh, conducted the relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom has to been to find grievances with which she can uh, address her members in her party uh, to encourage them to keep voting the SNP and keep believing that there will be an independent Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, well, finally, uh, Lord Davis saying, you know, how do you look at this you know, long term uh, relationship between the UK and China. As you mentioned, the two nations are important, the trading nations. Uh, they see the, the importance in trading and also uh, both sides actually push for more globalization instead of deglobalization. Uh, do you see uh, maybe long term uh, somehow we can overcome the differences and keep the relationship stable, uh, which is beneficial obviously for both sides? Well, I, I certainly hope that that will be the case. Um, as you pointed out earlier, there has been a volatility in this relationship. We were in a period of very close partnership in 2015, and here we are a few years later, where there's a, a slightly chilling effect within the relationship. Objectively, we have to have a sensible, pragmatic relationship. We will get back to that. It's a question of when. My one hope is that uh, in the next election, the Labour Party comes in to form the next administration, and that that administration will take a more rational, balanced approach to the relationship, and we can get back to discussing matters on a pragmatic basis, where we can identify our mutual interests, where we can work together, the spirit of cooperation, to possibly improve matters throughout the world, but certainly between our two great nations. Mm -hmm. A balanced approach. Thank you, Lord Davison. Thank you for your time and insight. With that, we can conclude today's show. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>